All right. How's everybody doing this evening? So good to see y'all. I know they're reporting that storms are coming this way, but we should be out of here before them. And uh, they just helped me sleep better anyway, so hallelujah. I'm excited about it. So everybody wants to know how the lady's doing uh, that hit the building. So we did go connect with their family up at the waiting room at Kennestone and uh, went in, found out good Christian people. Um, the, you know, of course, they called them and said, bring all your family in because she will not make it. So they all came up from Daytona and one of them's a pastor and stuff. So they all get up there praying. Of course, I told them we had our church praying and, and uh, her vital signs went up. So then the doctor said, well, her vital signs are going up. We will try taking her off life support, but she'll never recover. You know, she's going to be a vegetable. She'll never be able to talk again or anything like that. So when they took her off life support, she woke up and told them her name. So I know, I know. Amen. Amen. So you know, who knows? She may be coming to visit us in church soon. She is a, she's been a teacher for 38 years and she was a teacher at Tap Middle School and so uh, I didn't ask, you know, they say it was some kind of medical emergency that made her seize up. Uh, I didn't ask. I was hoping they would just volunteer it, but I didn't ask. I was just rejoicing with the mama because her daughter's getting better. Amen. Danny was uh, blessing her. We had somebody at the church give some money so they could buy some food and stuff. And Danny gave that to them. And now Danny's wanting to put together a gift basket and take it up there to the waiting room and stuff. But really, really sweet people. So praise the Lord. All right. So let's see, a few announcements. Of course, Children's Church is going on. Youth are down there. This Sunday, uh, Doug Pittman will be here. Uh, he is one of the missionaries that we support every time we release a tithe of the tithe. And he's a missionary to Ukraine. And so I can't wait for him to come and give us an update. Because boots on the ground on the front line will tell us what's happening a lot more than anything you'll see on the news. Amen. And, of course, one of the big ministries that he has going on over there, a lot of the pictures he sends me, is now that the war's been going on for a little while, you've got a lot of orphans. And so we'll just have to be praying about what extra we're going to do to help him. But he'll be here Sunday morning. We're going to let him have the whole service, bring us up to date and preach. He preaches all over the world. I expect a great move of God this Sunday. Then the next two Sundays, we're doing Taste of Livingstone. So out there in the foyer, um, just pay attention whether you're signing up for the 21st or the 28th if you're interested in doing a Taste of Living Stone. That's where we meet in the fellowship hall. We give you a snack. We load you up on golf carts. We take you around the campus, introduce you to all the staff, share everything about the ministries. We end in the history room where uh, we explain to you how all this came together, the rich history of OBT before we got here. And then you have a right to ask any question you want, whether it's financial, theological. We're an open book. And if you like your taste of Living Stone, then on May 5th, you can join Living Stone. And then we want to help you get plugged in and one day lead and so forth. So if you'd like to be part of that, also on the 28th, we're doing baptism. I've got three so far from our church. And I think the drug program has maybe five or six so far. So uh, that we'll be baptizing on April 28th. So if you want to be part of that, if you've never followed the Lord in baptism, or a lot of people say, you know what, I did when I was young, but now I'm older and I really want to get up and confess God with a full understanding of what I'm doing. Some people last time told me they'd gotten off track. They wanted to make a public confession of rededication, whatever the case may be. All that's appropriate. I look at it like renewing your vows. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, renewing your vows is just a healthy thing to do. Amen. So whether you need to do that because you never follow the Lord or you want to do it for that reason, please call me. Let me know. I want to make sure you do understand what's going on and tell you what you need to do to get ready for the 28th. Um, we also are sponsoring a table uh, for a fundraiser for um, First Care Women's Center. Uh, you know that's the Cobb Pregnancy Center that we support through the church. If you're a tither, you support all these things. But they're building a brand new one. They're building a second location right here on East West Connector, right where the Home Depot was before it moved, where Chipotle is. So we're very excited about that. You know, we need to be really involved in that pregnancy center up there. So the banquet is going to be Thursday, May 2nd. So if you guys are interested in going, please let Danny or I know. 
Now, it is a fundraiser, okay? It's at the Galleria. The guy who's speaking, man, you need to look it up. He is on fire. Anyway, it's going to be fun. But, you know, it is a fundraiser, so it's not a free dinner. <laughs> Amen? You know, if you don't believe in it when you hear about it, you don't want to give, that's one thing. But you shouldn't go in there with an attitude that you're going to go and just have a nice dinner at the gallery and hear some good preaching. Amen? It is a fundraiser. So let us know about that. Well, if you can remember all that, you're doing good. Keep up with your bulletin. Keep up with the website. Amen? Okay, why have I got all these hands going up? What's going on? Okay, senior luncheon. That's the fourth Saturday of every month. It's going to be going on. Amen. We'll make sure everybody's getting ready for that potluck before it comes. What's Miss Jeanette? Oh, wonderful, man. Danny will be very excited. Amen. Tell them, let us know, man. We'll, we'll sponsor two tables if we get enough people. Amen. All right, Danny will be very excited about that. All right, y'all ready to get in the Word of God? All right, well, this is our 39th class on And the Light Shines in the Darkness, and I'm calling this one, It Is the Last Hour. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord God, as we come before you tonight, we ask you to send the truth teacher, the Holy Spirit of God, into this place. We're asking you to open our hearts and our minds to receive the truth of your word. We need spiritual eyes to see, spiritual ears to hear, wisdom to apply. That when we walk out of these doors, Lord, we pray that we're going to know you better than when we came and be better prepared to live in this last hour than when we got here. And we thank you for that in the name of the only one who's ever made that possible. That is in the name of your precious son, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen and amen. All right, so it is a verse-by-verse -verse study. Uh, you have your notes. If you're joining us online, you can download your notes right there. Um, everything in the bold prints, the Word of God. We're going to try to get out of this passage. This is the third week we've been in this one passage. But 1 John 2, 12 through 14 says this, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for His namesake. I write to you, fathers, because you've known Him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you've overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you've known the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Now, if you've been in here the last two weeks, you know a lot of what that means because we've been on it for two weeks. Amen? And i just give you a quick review because, you know, review can take too long. Here we have five steps of spiritual growth, two steps of childhood, two steps of sonship, one step of fatherhood, which we will look at tonight. Remember, the first one, I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. That's the word technia. Same thing you find in John 1, 12. To many as received him, he gave the right to become the children of God. The next time he writes to children is padia. In the natural, what's happening is, is the Lord's taking us to the natural to run a parallel to the spiritual. Amen? So that's like elementary school age. When you begin to learn about the Father, that's why it says... I write to you, little children, because you've known the Father. That's where you start. Amen. Then it says, I write to you, young men. And he gives two different statements. Uses the same word so you can tell there's two different steps. One of them is because you've overcome the wicked one. The other one is because you're strong. The word of God abides in you and you've overcome the wicked one. That's where we ended last week. So today we're going to be talking about fathers. And if you want to look at your notes, I put this. John writes to fathers twice but gives the same description both times. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. Well, who is from the beginning? Well, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Amen? That particular name of God is Elohim. Elohim encompasses the whole trinity. Elohim is the one who said, uh, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make man in our image, according to our likeness. And man was created in God's likeness. But then man fell. Amen? So Jesus has come to reconcile us to himself. And so that's what happens by the time you become a father in the faith, you are becoming back. You haven't just been brought back positionally. You're being brought back spiritually to what you should be before man fell. And I, I put this in your notes. That is what a father, that is the word pater, and it's where we get our word paternal from. 
As a matter of fact, in scriptures, in Greek, a family is a patria. If you remember, the second step of childhood is a um, padilla. They're all related. When you're in that step, you know, you have a baby born. You look at that baby and they'll say, well, he's got his mama's eyes or whatever. But whenever you enter that elementary years, you really begin to favor one of your parents, if not both, but not just in appearance, but now your personality is being developed. Well, it's the same thing in spiritual growth. Amen? And so we spend a lot of time talking about how, uh, you know, you have all these wonderful rights and privileges because you're born again, you're joint heirs with Christ, but you can't have any of it because you haven't grown up to that point. By the time you're a father, you're now not only trusted with your inheritance, you're starting to disperse your inheritance. So look at this. It says, this is what a father, a patir in the faith becomes. These persons, right, spiritually matured with the gifts of the Spirit operating. Remember, that's the first step of sonship. The second step, whether you want to call it husbandship, brideship, because we're the bride of Christ, whatever. Also, the fruit of the Spirit is now manifested to the point they now reflect the image of God. People often say God is like a father. No, he is not. God is not like anyone, okay? God is the Father. So the more we become like him, the more and more of a father we become. So he's not like a father. He's the Father. And the more you're like him, the more of a father you are. Amen? Okay. Fathers set patterns for living. And I put this in your notes. Show me a father who loves baseball, and I'll show you a little boy with a baseball hat on. All right? Even, son, even the son, Jesus Christ, what did he say? I came to show you or reflect the father. A father in the faith is like the Apostle Paul who grew to the point, when I write a book on this, I'm going to go through. You can take Paul's writing, what year he wrote, and you can watch him grow by things he says. And by the time he's writing to the church in Corinth, he says this, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Now, remember when he wrote the book of Romans, he's going, look, there's things I want to do and I don't do them and the things I do do, I don't want to do and he's got all this. Now he comes to a point where he says, imitate me. I put this on your page too. In other words, what Paul is saying, pattern your life after me as I pattern my life after Christ who patterned his life exactly like the father showed him. Right? I gave you an example. I would say a father in the faith would be Billy Graham. Billy Graham uh, never had any scandals in his ministry, served God all of his life, and you couldn't count how many evangelists modeled or patterned their ministries after his evangelistic ministry. He would be a perfect example, modern-day uh, father in the faith, if you ask me. All right? God loves us so much that he came as a baby in a manger, lived a sinless life, showed his love for, his, for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Right? But God, by the time you get to know God like a father, you also understand he's also still the fire on the mountain. Paul said this, it's a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of a living God, for our God is a consuming fire. So you don't just know him as daddy who you cry to. You begin to have a reverence for him, a fear of the Lord like was taught on the mountain. Amen. I put this in your notes. You understand that he's a father who chastises those he loves, scourges every son whom he receives. That's found in Hebrews. That's found in Psalms. That's found in Revelations. Uh, he says, I chastise those I love. Now, when the apostle Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians, he said this. He said, for this reason, I bow my knees, not to Christ, although you do because they're one, but I bow my knees to the Father. So what is Paul saying? He's saying, I've come to the point where I have a deep relationship with the Father. And that's really what we're to grow to. What did Jesus say? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He said salvation is to know the Father. So he came as to show the Father, but you grow to the point where you begin to have a healthy relationship with the Father through Christ by the Holy Ghost. Okay? There's a, there's a different depth to your relationship. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family, or patria, 
in heaven and earth is named, or you could say derives its name. Amen? Now it goes on to say this, that he, speaking of the Father, would grant to you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, now this comes with maturity, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length, the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Okay, to be filled with the fullness of God is when you come to a place where you give Him access into every area of your being. You know, baptism of the Holy Ghost, we Pentecostals know that's, that's another work of grace, right? You've got salvation, you've got sanctification, you've got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Listen, you know when that comes upon you, you ask for it, but you also got to yield yourself to Him. He's talking about a full relationship. Uh, let, me just, let, let me just drop down to the second paragraph in your notes. That he, speaking of the Father, would grant you. What does that mean? Give you several blessings at the appropriate times. Now, if you've been in class, you know what I'm talking about. That are appointed by the Father. Remember Galatians 4, 1 through 7? It says, as long as you remain a child, you're no different than a slave, even though you're master of all. Why? Because when a child is born, everything that belongs to his parents belongs to him, right? So when you're born again, see, when Jesus Christ died, a will went into effect. The moment you accepted that death as an atonement for your sins, your name's put on that will, on that inheritance. So you're now a joint heir with Christ. But as long as you're a child, you differ at all from a slave because you don't know what to do with it any more than when a baby's born can you give the baby the family checkbook. It doesn't know what to do with it. So that's what we're talking about is growing into it. If you remember in Galatians 4, it tells you that as you grow, God appoints the times that you can be trusted with things. That's what we're talking about right here. Now, to be strengthened with might is to become mighty by His power, which the Holy Spirit releases to work in the believers as they mature. It's already in you. The moment that you're saved, the same power that resurrected Jesus Christ from the grave lives in you. But you don't know what to do with it. That's why Paul says, I pray that your eyes will be opened, that your understanding will be enlightened, that you'll know the hope of your calling, Ephesians 2. He's praying about these things so that you can walk in all that God did for you. Then in, in Galatians 4, it says that he did not just die so you could be a child, but you might receive the adoption as mature sons. Amen? Okay. Now, being rooted like a tree and grounded like a building on a strong foundation, like the wise master builder who built his house upon the rock, which could not be shaken, Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Go on over to page 3. If you weren't here the last couple of weeks... This might be a little bit hard to follow, okay? So why does Paul there take us to the example of being rooted and grounded like a building or a tree? If you remember, we looked at briefly the Sermon on the Mount. It's the longest running discourse of Christ, and it's re really all about spiritual growth, okay? And I give you the notes, okay? The wise master builder is the parable which Jesus uses to close the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> which was all about spiritual growth, that you shall be perfect or mature just as your Father in heaven is. That's in Matthew 5, 48. Now, if you remember, everything written from 5, 3 to 5, 44, and after it wraps it up, where you pray for those who curse you, you love your enemies, not just the... Uh, it says that. All that's written, that you may be sons matured as your Father in heaven, okay? Then it says, then after you become a son, that you may be perfect or mature or complete as your fatherly heaven, your Father in heaven is. Then, and I'm not going to put it out for you because we'll never get past it. Starting in Matthew 6, 1, it begins to talk to you about fathers. 
Okay, so let me give you an example. You go back to Matthew 5, 14, all right? And he tells you, you are the light of the world. So let your light so shine that when men see your good works, that they glorify your Father in heaven. Now, same message. He never takes a break. Same sermon. When you come and he says, may you be perfected as your Father in heaven is perfect. perfect. You know what the next thing he says? Do everything in secret. Don't let anybody see what you're doing. Go into your prayer closet. When you give, you give in secret. Okay, so which one is it? Am I to let my light shine so everybody sees it? That they can glorify my Father in heaven? Or am I supposed to do everything in secret? It's a sign of maturity. Fathers are in the background. Fathers now provide so children can do. And I'll give an example from this morning. This morning, Philip and Doug are sharing a testimony with me. They're over where one of our members, Heather, um, um, she manages an apartment community. And the owner of Walton Community is there, very mature Christian man. And he's walking around, and he introduces himself as someone who works for Walton. Okay? And he's just connecting with the people, and he's there to celebrate what the employees are doing. He's taking no light. He's taking no credit. That's what a father does. A father lets all of them do work that everyone can see is glorified. Amen? When you look at a family, it's all about the children doing things. You can see the result of the father, the home, all that stuff, but he's not out front trying to claim anything. All he's doing is talking about the kids, right? Look at the example of Jesus. Everything Jesus did was to glorify the father, but everything the father did was to glorify the son. Right? Gave him all authority. I'm talking about granted to him. He's the, the son is who we're going to stand before when we're judged. Right? At the judgment seat of Christ. So it's a passing down, a passing of the torch. That's what fathers do. So that just gives you an example. You can read it for yourself and study it. If we keep on going, we'll be there all night. All right? To comprehend means to receive experientially, not simply understand intellectually. That's what I love about this journey that we're on. It's not just coming to read things and have some philosophy to live by. You experience the Word of God in your life. And I'm always telling you guys this. When you get the Word of God in your hand and the experience in your life, no one can take that from you. I don't care how theological, what they want to debate. People can debate. Is Jesus truly the Savior? When you're a new creation in Christ, old things pass away, behold, all things become new, the debate's over. Then people can say, well, did all the gifts cease back with the apostles? A lot of people are called sensationists. They believe that. But when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost or you're healed or whatever it may be, the debate's over. Amen? So you, this is something that you experience. So when he's talking about comprehending, he's praying that we'll comprehend things. He's talking about, I want you not just to know them intellectually. I want you to experience these things. And what is one of them? To be filled with all the fullness of God. Means that you have a broad-based relationship with Elohim, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit participating in all of God's blessings, resources, and wisdom that God has laid out for you as you grow up. You know, the Word of God says, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more do you think your Father in Heaven can give you good gifts? If you know that when a child is born, you want to start putting aside some money for their education 20 years from now, what do you think God has in store for you 20 years from now? Come on now. I'm talking about he's got the resources. He's got the plan. He understands you. All you got to do is get with him and follow him. Amen? All right. And we've talked a lot about how that happens. So let's get going and we're going to be there forever. All right. Here we go. Here come next verse. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Well, when the Bible talks about the world, what's it talking about? It's talking about the world system. It's talking about the world system. Now, I put this in your notes that on the first paragraph. Do not love the world describes the world system. Influenced by Satan, and we'll get deeper into that. First John gets deeper into that. Which desires to operate apart from God. And if you want to go back and see the mindset, you go back to the Tower of Babel. 
God said, I want you to, to, to spread across the earth, you know, and refill it. And so this guy named Nimrod comes along and goes, uh-uh, we're going to all come together. We're going to build back better. We're going to build us a tower. Send another flood. You won't get us, right? We're going to build a tower up to the heavens, and we're going to make a name for ourselves. That's the world mindset, okay? A world that wants to, and that's just important what he's about to get into. So understand when he talks about the world in that way, he's not talking about the trees and the grass. He's talking about that and then the things that that system has to offer, the temptations that will take you away. Just like the Word of God is like a seed, and one of the things that chokes it out is the cares of the world and the riches of the world and the deceitfulness of those riches. But, man, I'm talking about God wants you to have an abundant life. The problem is, is you got to get focused on the giver and not what he gives. All right, here we go. Just like Jesus says, you can't serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon because you're going to end up hating one and loving the other. That's exactly what John says here in a different way. So let's read it. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. You can't be going two directions at the same time. Just like you got to choose whom you're going to serve, God or money. Money is a wonderful tool, a horrible master, right? So if you love the Father, and how many, how many of you noticed it? I mean, there's things in the world, man, just turn me off. I mean, I don't like listening to them. I don't like being around them. If it wasn't for the fact that I knew I used to be just like them, I wouldn't have nothing to do with them. <laughs> but because I was just like them, I want to see them get saved. But the things of the world have no lure anymore, man. It makes you sick. For all that is in the world, and he gives you a list, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, none of that is of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Okay, so I put this in your notes. The lust of the flesh. It is the impulsive desire that originates in the sinful human nature and results in sensuality and other illicit cravings. If you go to Galatians 5, 19 through 21, it lists the works of the flesh. You know, drunkenness, fornication, sorcery, which is pharmacia, the use of drugs. I mean, I'm talking about arguing, fighting, rebelling. All that stuff's the works of the flesh. The lust of the eyes are the greedy cravings that want whatever it sees. Proverbs 27, 20 says this, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. So what's he saying? Okay. There's other places in Scripture it tells you Sheol just wants to open up its mouth to swallow people in. Okay. Hell and destruction, it's a fire, right? So think of a fire. If you build a little fire, it only takes a little wood to keep it going. But the more wood you throw in it, the hotter it burns and the more wood it takes to keep it going. That's the way people's eyes are. Okay? They want this car, then they want that car, then they want that car. You know, there's an old saying, how much money's enough? Just a little bit more. Okay? You got to throw more and throw more. If you're looking for satisfaction in the world, you're always going to come to a place, be empty, and you're going to need to throw more in to keep it burning. All right. Here we go. The pride of life. What is that? It's a boastful pretensions and bragging beyond the limits of reality. It's an overconfident pride because of one's possessions that bring a fake or false sense of security. What did Jesus say? He says, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? And there's so many scriptures. What did Jesus say? He says, do not store up. I didn't put this in your notes. But he says, do not store up treasures on earth where rot, rust, and moth destroy, right? But store up treasures in heaven. Well, what does it say here in John? It says that the pride of all these things is passing away. It's all going to deteriorate. I put this on page four, and uh, we're doing good. We're coming in for landing. But it says, none of the temptations are of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. The world will soon experience the fruit of its labor during the tribulation. The world wants to live apart from God. The world wants to persecute the church, hates the church, doesn't want to have anything to do with the church. Well, I got news for you. God's going to pull the church out of here 
Now, a lot of people are going to decide, I want to run. There's going to be people saved during the tribulation. God's already shown me there will be an underground church in our gym after the, tribula after the rapture takes place, during the tribulation. People will be running. That's why he named this church Living Stone. It will still be here then. We're going to be gone. Amen? But people are going to come around, but a lot of them are not, and they're going to find out exactly what their ways, their philosophies, their desires, the fruit of it. Amen? Okay. But then look what it says. But he who does the will of God abides forever, and we will never lack anything. You know, Psalms 23.1 says, When the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And you know, some versions say, When the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. Well, that's true, but it goes deeper than that. See, lacking is from your perspective. One person can live with little and just be totally at peace. Another person that's got the eyes like fire, they have a lot and think they're lacking, right? That's not what the Word of God says. It says when you really begin to make him your shepherd and you follow him and go where he goes, you don't want. That's a peace that surpasses understanding. You're not just not lacking. You're not wanting other things. You know, I walk around my house. There's nothing I want to do to my home. Not one thing. I don't want another house. I don't want to do anything else to it. I mean, I walk in stores. There's nothing I want to buy. I mean, I don't want. Okay? That is a beautiful place to live. Amen? Matthew 6, says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And he'll add all that stuff. What is he saying? That after all that stuff the Gentiles seek, he'll just add it to you. You know, he'll just add it to you. You know, my wife's favorite verse is uh, Psalms 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. He doesn't just give you what you want. He puts the want-tos in you, and then he fulfills them. I mean, man, we got it made. And the people who want to reject Christ and reject God... And trust in the world, it's all going to pass away on them. They're not going to be able to keep it. It's just, I mean, it's just, it's a, it's just a, a heartbreaking thing to watch and to think about. When I look at some of our politicians and the way they just get up there and they just lie, and it's like, how much money is enough? Do you not understand that any day now you're going to be standing before Almighty God? What are you thinking? What more power do you want? Man, man, oh man, oh man. All right, here we go. Here's our title verse. 1 John 2, 18. Little children, you should know that. That's the Padilla stage. All right, this is the word Padilla. That means those that are beginning to get to know the Father. Now you're saved. You're not, you're not ready to lead. Okay, you got get, you, you're, you're just beginning to get into the Word of God enough to really get to know God. So there's some warnings because that's a dev, that is a dangerous stage to be in. How many of you know that elementary age school children, because that's what it describes, are in a dangerous place? That's why the enemy's coming after them. You know, the enemy's coming after them, wanting to go after them to cause gender confusion. You know why? Because they're at an age where you can really confuse them. So John is about to give some warnings to some believers that are studying the Word of God, and there's some things going on. And here's what he says. He says, little children, it is the last hour. Okay, and I put this in your notes. What does that mean? It's the hour of the last things as we know them. See, the end of everything is the beginning of something new, right? So the church age, and I put this in your notes, the last hour was introduced by the first coming of Jesus. At the end of that period, also known as the church age, a person will arise known as the Antichrist, or the lawless one of 2 Thessalonians. And here's what he says. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know it is the last hour. Okay, that word, now John is the only one who uses Antichrist. All right, he's described as a, as a man of perdition, uh, the abomination of desolation. He's described as a lawless one. The one that John used is the one that caught on. Everybody's heard of the Antichrist, right? That word anti can mean either one who stands openly against the Lord or one who tries to present himself as a substitute for him, which can be a more of a subtle form of opposition. And usually that's the way people start. Like Jim Jones. He started out as a preacher, 
Then he started portraying himself as this man of God and started doing all these false miracles, got all these people to follow him down there to what was it? Guam or Guatemala or wherever they were. And gets on, and then he starts going off the charts claiming to be the Christ, right? Started off subtle and came into that. You know, it's people like, I put this in your notes. Uh, even now many antichrists have come. Are many people displaying the same traits for they have the same spirit, that's what it's talking about, working in them, which is influenced by Satan himself. Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel is a perfect example. If you study Antiochus Epiphanes, or Hitler for that matter, but many are much more subtle as John is about to address. Now, before we get into that, this was just blew my mind because if you've been around and we've studied a lot about end times around here, you know that the Antichrist, you know, people would, well, often thought, you know, he was going to be the Pope. He's not going to be the Pope. Uh, the Pope's probably going to be the false prophet, okay? Uh, but it's going, to, it's, going to be an, it's going to be from Islam. And how many of you heard about the 18-year-old who was going to blow up churches and burn churches and kill people in churches this weekend, and the FBI caught him? They showed, I'm sitting there studying this in the morning, and they showed his letter that he wrote. Philip, will you throw that up there for us? And here's what he wrote. I have three things to say. The first, I pledge my allegiance to the imam of the Muslims the commander of the faithful, the Sheikh, the Mahid, the Caliph, or Caliph, or you can say it this, the Caliphate, yeah, all that comes from that word, all right, gives those things. I pledge to selfishly hear and obey in times of ease and hardship, in matters of delight and dislike, never to disobey those in authority unless I have a clear proof of kafar from which I will have from Allah, and Allah is the witness to my pledge. So when he pleads his allegiance to this imam, he's also called the 12th imam, he's also called the caliphate, Isis believes he's alive. He is also, in their eyes, the first horseman of the apocalypse. He is the antichrist. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I pledge my allegiance to the antichrist that we believe is alive right now. And that's who Isis is trying to instill. The reason ISIS carries black flags is it's in Muslim prophecy that when they plant those black flags on the Temple Mount, because how many of you know that's where he's going to defile the third temple, that when they plant those black flags there, the one who does that is our first horseman of the apocalypse. They know that we consider him the Antichrist. And that just blows my mind that we're sitting here reading about this, and now we got this young man about to blow up churches pleading allegiance to him. ISIS believes they have them. Anyway, prophecy being fulfilled right before our eyes in real time. Amen? Okay, here we go. Now, here's the ones that John's talking about. 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us. So, in other words, the ones he's addressing were part of the church or checking out the church. Amen? They went out from us, from the church, from our teaching, but they were really not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Jim Jones, he had him a church, and when everybody started realizing what he was doing, what did he do? Came out and got a 1,000 people to follow him. That's the same thing that was going on in John's day. Okay? And I put this in your note. To be in the church and decide that you want to live separate from the body of Christ in its teaching is the same spirit as the Antichrist and the world that desires to live independent from God. If people don't want to be a part of the church, you're wanting to live independent of His commandments. That's all the same spirit. Often these people reject the teaching of the Bible and substitute it with another teaching. Okay, we're done here on the last page. One of the main reasons that people do that is pride. Why? They want to be the one with all the answers to life. In other words, they want to be like God. In other words, people will come out of the church and they'll come up with philosophies and books they want to charge you a bunch of money for so that you'll be telling them, thank you for the wisdom. Thank you for helping me. Thank you. That's really what's feeding them. You, you know, you, I, I got involved in a cult called Scientology. I didn't know anything about Jesus. That's all that was about. L. Ron Hubbard wanted to be like God. 
wanted to come up with different answers so that everybody, and they do. You go to the Church of Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard's dead. They got his picture and everybody claps. Okay, they're still thanking him after his death for this wonderful wisdom, contrary to the Bible, that he's given that leads to absolutely nowhere and one way, one day will lead to complete and total destruction in the people's lives who follow it. All right, here we go. And see, the reason I fell for it is because you got people like, you know, you got people like, uh, who's the guy that was in the dancing guy? John Travolta. You got Cruz, you know, you got all these rich people. I mean, every time I go to a class, they'd want another $5,000. I thought, $5,000 for a class? I'll learn something. Shh. All right, here we go. First John 2, 20 through 22. And the truth, isn't that crazy? And the truth was the free in the, in the drawer of every hotel room. And I'm paying those people, you know, if I didn't give them 30 grand back in the 80s, that's a lot of money in the 80s. Huh? Going to their crazy classes and the, and the answer was right there for free. All right. <laughs> See, you can't charge for the gospel. See, but that's the power of what we're doing here because we found something true. So we're all willing to pay the bills around here, buy Bibles and give them away, send money, because we know we got something that was free to us and we want it to be free to everybody else. You can't stop that. All right. 1 John 2, 20 through 22. But you, speaking to you, all of you that have remained, all of you that have worked like, like Hebrew slaves today and drug yourself in here to hear the word of God, that tells us something. Okay, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. There's only one. The Holy One, and you know all things. All right? When it says anointing, that's the same word for spiritual gift. It's the word charisma. What is charisma? It's an endowment of grace. The word grace is charis. So grace, the divine influence, the Holy Spirit in my heart that's reflected in my life, you have a special endowment of it. That's a spiritual gift. Well, he's saying you're anointed to know these things. In other words, the, the Spirit has gifts. They're all in you. You only need them when you need them. So you don't just walk around in them, but when you need them, they're there. Now, some gifts manifest that you walk in or called in, office gifts. But the one he's talking about here is discernment. You know the truth when you hear it. Listen to that, uh, the Holy Ghost, that still small voice that's in you. That's what he's really trying to get across. See, look at what he says. I have not written to you because you don't know the truth. You know it. Now, you're little children. Remember, he's talking to little children. He's not talking to people who've been studying the Bible forever. But if you have Jesus in you, he says, I am the way, the you got the truth. You know it. If you know Jesus, you know it, right? And because you know it, and you should know that no lie is of the truth. In other words, they don't go together any more than loving the Father and loving the world or serving God and money. There's certain things just don't go together. Lies and truth don't coexist, right? Who is a liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Say the Christ. Okay. So Jesus warned that people would come along and say, I'm the Christ and deceive many. That can be people saying that they are Christ. That can also be people saying Jesus is Christ, but they're not really pointing to Jesus as Christ. Okay? You don't understand. If you don't really understand what that means, do you know what mean the meaning of the word Christ? Anointed one. There is no one anointed like Christ was anointed. There's only one Christ. There's not all these different paths to God. If you really believe that he is the Christ, the anointed one sent from God, then you have to believe every word he said. And he said, no one comes to the Father but by me. That means you believe that, okay? Now look what it goes on to say. So he is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. And I put this in the bottom paragraph before the last verses we're going to look at. Who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. The word Christ means anointed one or God in the flesh, which means everything Jesus said is the absolute infallible word of God for Jesus is the word made flesh remember knowing him who is from the beginning in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God who said I'm the way the truth and life no one comes to the father but by me and then I just put etc 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 I mean the things like you know when Jesus would say things we went through this whole book of John when he would tell tell the Pharisees you know I am 
before Abraham was, I am. Right? I mean, I'm talking about when you, when you really accept Christ as the Christ, you got to put aside everything else. you got to become a fool of the world's wisdom because the world's wisdom is foolishness with God. And i got news for you. God's wisdom is foolishness to the world. It's too simple. When I accepted Christ after being involved, and I read all these self-help books and studied psychology, got involved in Scientology, when I understood the gospel for the first time, I remember, I said, that's God. You know why? The simplicity of it. That is not how man thinks. Man thinks, read this book, give me some money, give me a few grand, I'll help you do a little better. God comes along and says, you'll never do better. You're so screwed up, my son had to die to pay your price. That's not how man thinks. And if you'll just receive me, I'm going to give you everything you need for free. That's not God. That's not man. That's God. Shh. Right, here we go. Last one. Whoever denies the son does not have the father either. In other words, don't tell me you have a relationship with God denying Jesus Christ. You can't. He who acknowledges the son, and I'm going to talk about that in order in just a minute, has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, talking about when you accepted Christ, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He has promised us, eternal life. And go on over the last page. This word acknowledge is a deep belief and confession that Jesus Christ is who He says He is the one and only Son of God, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. See, you should have perished, but now you should not because He's paid your price. It wouldn't be right for you to perish once you accept what He has done for you. Amen? And I just put in your notes, do not let go of that truth. Amen? Don't let go of us. May we all abide in Him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, man, that's a whole lot of teaching in a short amount of time. If you got any questions, nobody's in a hurry. If you want to hang out, we're ready to fellowship. But especially for you that have joined us online, I just want to bless all of you right now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May your days be free from fear, and may you be blessed with the spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind all the days of your life. May God give you a hunger for his word. Revelation knowledge to understand. For it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. May God bless you with powerful spirits, the fullness of God, that in every weakness you be made strong. May God bless everything you people touch that brings glory to his name. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you, May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful evening in the Lord. God bless.